Okay, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Very excited to be here and share this topic uh, with you that hopefully, no matter what age you are, you will find interesting. Um, that's one, uh, one of the themes is that aging is not about being older, it's about being not 23 anymore. So hopefully everyone will have a little bit of a takeaway on this topic. I like to start with this slide. It's a little bright in here, but hopefully you could see that. Can everyone see what's going on there? Well, um, does everyone know what this is capturing here? So maybe, it, maybe some of you are fortunate enough to not know this experience of having arrived at the refrigerator only to have no idea what it is that you uh, are going to do there, even though seven seconds ago you knew exactly, right? So you have one, this is like a real world working memory experiment. We'll talk a little about working memory. You knew exactly what you wanted to get, one item, and then to your amusement and frustration, that information is gone. And this, I put it as my first slide because it was uh, this observation that many people have made, as everyone experiences here, we're all on, that, on the same page, right? Uh, this is such a frequent description that I heard as, a, as a neurologist that it really inspired what you're going to hear uh, uh, forward. So this is, this is my introduction because it's a reminder of the very real world nature of this, which is really at the core, probably not a memory problem per se, as that, although most people reflexively think that it is because you can't remember something, but really probably an attention and a distraction problem. And we're going to cycle back to that. More of a, of a classic motivation are these topics. And I wrote this slide, I think, when I was 10 years ago when I was doing job talks. And it's still so relevant now And that, you know, the first is, as we know, our population is aging. It's not even a US phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon. But there's actually another shift that's quite salient. I'm sure a lot of you are aware is that the expectations of what we feel we should be capable of when we're older has also shifted. And you see that demand from the older population, and as I said, that concept of what it even means to be older is changing. But in what they want to do has really dramatically changed and put this demand on the, on the system to understand and, and preserve that as best as possible. But we do know that age-related cognitive deficits, independent of pathologies like Alzheimer's and other type of dementias, impair um, uh, across many different domains, and that even mild deficits can impair quality of life. So it doesn't have to be debilitating and a full-out functional impairment where you are um, you know, reach a level of pathology, but even minor impacts uh, really can, can influence how you live your life. And so I've been really motivated for a long time to understand what are the basic neural mechanisms, so the changes in your brain, that underlie the broad spectrum of deficits. So as opposed to focusing on just one deficit and trying to pin it down, what is the, the baseline that's affected that leads to that? This is just an overview of my research program, and often also an overview of what I'm going to talk to you about today. We do a lot of work on just basic cognitive neuroscience, and I think one of the things that we do uniquely that I'm excited about is that we use multiple methodologies and then converge it all on the same problem. So from functional MRI to electroencephalography to transcranial electrical stimulation, both magnetic and electrical, um, we apply these tools sometimes on the same people to understand how neural networks underlie higher order cognitive abilities, and especially this concept of the distraction that we'll come back to. And then once we understand the system to some degree, we have biomarkers, we have neural behavioral correlations, we ask how it changes in different populations. I focused on this population since 1992 when I was a, a graduate student and trying to understand what happens in the aging brain even independent of pathology. So this is a big focus of our work. And then we have an increasing amount of the efforts in our lab devoted to understanding how we can use our knowledge of the system how the system changes to create novel interventions to improve how our brain functions. Um, I'm going to largely talk about this today. I almost only get tasked to talk about this now, um, since it's some of our re most recent papers. But I think it'll be fun to step back. This is actually the first time I've given a talk like this, where I'm going to frame it from the perspective of the work that we've done over the last 10 years in understanding the healthy aging brain and the changes that occur in the neural systems that lead to cognitive deficits. And then I'm going to tell you about one study in our uh, plasticity work. So it'll transition from this is why we're trying to impact it, and then this is how we're doing that. 
This is an observation that probably many of you have made, um, and it's quite um, obvious in our lives, but it's not always frequently studied. And that's that there is an interaction between our attention abilities and our memory. And if you were just going to ask who's going to remember the details of, of the event, this woman quietly reading this book, or this gentleman in this busy scene, everyone would just know it, it's this person here. And that's because our memory doesn't take place in a bubble, but it's impacted by what surrounds us, our environment, and how much or how little we can interact with it based on our goals. And this led to uh, me becoming very interested in this phenomenon, which, oh, actually I forgot I have a quote here. So I was trying to find some information in the literature that tells us about this. And I actually found a quote from quite a long time ago that beautifully captures it. And Samuel Johnson, who's an author, said, the true art of memory is art of attention. No man will read with much advantage who is not able a pleasure to evacuate his mind. And if the repositories of thought are already full, what can they receive? If the mind is employed on the past or the future, the book will be held before the eyes in vain. Really insightful. There was no research on this topic done at the time. And there's probably an entire career of research projects just here in these phrases to try to decipher what someone's just really uh, very insightful view of the world around him is really uh, underlied by. Um, and when we try to understand how different aspects of our cognition and our behavior are interacting with each other, we can't uh, avoid to come to this phenomena, an umbrella term known as cognitive control. And how I define it, it's really our mental abilities that allow us to interact in this very complicated environment that we live in based on our goals. And it's really, I always think of it as a triad of abilities, each with many different subcategories. So one of them, selective attention. And this it includes the ability to focus, to ignore, to sustain, um, and the many other aspects that we use to direct our resources based on our goals. And we could do that while we're interacting with information in the world. We can also do it while it's gone. So we could hold it in mind, we can manipulate it, we can use it to guide our actions. And we might not just have one goal, we might have multiple goals. And so things like moving between tasks, task switching, or trying as best we can to do more than one task at the same time would fall into this category. And so thinking about this as a model system as this and the subcomponent abilities really are what enable us to interact in the world around us based on our goals, as I said, is really the foundation of a lot of the work that we're doing and what I'm going to tell you now. So what does this mean from a mechanistic point of view? Well, we know that we perceive the world not passively, right? It doesn't just flood into our minds. We're not really slaves to our sensory input, but it's shaped. And it's really shaped based on two main influences. One of them is external, stimulus-driven, something that we call bottom-up. And this is how the world around us imposes itself upon how we perceive it. Things that are very salient, like your name or, or a color or a flash of light um, a loud sound, demand your attention, even if you don't have goals to attend to that. And this is a very ancient sort of ability that's you know, inherently tied in with our survival in the world around us. But we have another ability, and that's to direct our attention like you're doing right now, based entirely on your goals, an internally motivated attention that we call top down which really is the basis of all of these cognitive control systems. And when we think about this from a neurophysiological or neuroanatomical perspective, you see that same interaction of bottom up and top down. So this is uh, the front part of the brain, the back part of the brain, and we know that visual information and other sensory information is uh, really primarily represented, at least in their first stop in the cortex, in primary cortices, like this is the visual cortex. And then information is transmitted along these streams which is another way of thinking of bottom-up processing. And what happens is you have the integration of many attributes to give you more complex representations of the world. And that can be driven largely entirely based on the stimuli. It could happen very rapidly. We know that there are areas in the brain, largely in the prefrontal cortex, but also areas in the parietal cortex, that can then send projections to these areas and modulate their activity based on your goals. And so again, we see this interface of bottom up from the environment and then how we shape the processing of it based on our goals. So I'll just leave that as, as a sort of introduction. We could talk an entire uh, hour about the complexities about this. And this is certainly oversimplified in that there's many little feedback loops along the way here. But I think it captures a general view and of, of how we guide our processing of information based on what we intend, our goals. So let's switch, and I'm going to tell you about three experiments um, that all have this type of design. This is a very classic design that 
those of us in the field study aging, it's probably not ideal. Ideally, we would study one person through their entire lives, um, but we don't always have the luxury of time to do that. And so we also often sample a younger population, an older population, hopefully balance on education. We are focusing here on what we consider to be a healthy older population, and we try to control that as, most of, uh, as best as possible. The reality is our population is usually super healthy, um, and these are the people that usually come into our lab. So when we see deficits, um, they're probably under-emphasizing what the entire population is experiencing, but um, it's helpful nonetheless. And then we do experiments with both functional MRI and EEG. These tools have converging strengths and weaknesses, so fMRI is better for spatial localization of seeing networks in the brain and what areas are communicating, while well, EEG is better to give us timing information about when events are occurring. So we almost always use both of them in parallel. So let me tell you about um, one other model system that we use that you'll see throughout the, this talk. And that's this concept of interference. And by interference, I mean interference with your goals. What are the type of uh, factors that prevent you from carrying out your goals that uh, put pressure on your cognitive control abilities and lead to deficits in performance. And we've categorized interference in this way. First, it can occur internally or externally. So let's just talk about externally to start. Even externally, we think of two different types of interference. One, we call distractions. This is irrelevant information that's around you. You're aware it's irrelevant. You want to ignore it. And your ability to do that or to not do that would be uh, fall into the category of a distraction. So you're in a restaurant, you're trying to have a conversation, you're just trying to shut out all the chatter around you and focus, and that's what we would think of as a source of external interference through a distraction. You could have the same stimuli, but then make the choice to attend to it as a secondary goal. And we think of that, we call that interruptions if it, if it occurs while you're already engaged in a task. A lot of people call it multitasking. And now, so for example, you could be in, the, in a restaurant and the waiter is saying the dinner, ta uh, the specials at the table next to you, and you're trying to have your conversation. Also, listen to that because you already missed that the first time through. And so, same type of stimuli, but now you choose to engage in both of them based on your goals. And this is another type of interference, and we'll talk about both of these. You don't need stimuli to have interference. You could create both. Um, internal sort of interruptions, we call diversions, by multitasking. You could be doing it right now, thinking about where you're going to have dinner tonight while listening to me. Or it could happen against your will, essentially, like irrelevant information that you're trying to ignore, also frequently called mind wandering. Usually fairly benign, but doesn't have to be. Intrusions can be pathological, like in OCD and PTSD and even depression, where they incapacitate you functionally because they're so intrusive. So this is sort of the framework that we use to study um, interference and how it impairs cognitive control. Um, we're just now working on this. This is pretty hard to study experimentally because it's hard to induce these internal types of interference, but these are much more under our control. So I'm going to start and tell you some experiments on distractions, and then I'm going to tell you some experiments on interruptions and show you how older adults and why they have more of difficulty in dealing with this. So this was the first experiment that I performed when I started in this field, so it's around a decade ago now. And um, if this is the structure of it. So this is over time. Let's just start with one task over here. You presented these four stimuli one at a time. So this is how we present paradigms here. They're each around a second. You see a face, a scene, a face, a scene. The order can be jumbled up. And you're told what's relevant and what's irrelevant. So it's essentially a selective attention experiment. Remember the faces, ignore the scene. Remember the scenes in this case. Ignore the faces, they're irrelevant. Then you have to hold it in mind. So this is a working memory experiment or short-term memory. Holding it in mind for a short period of time. And then you're probed here with the scene that says, is this one of the scenes that you saw before, yes or no? And so we, we probe your memory. So it's a combined attention and working memory experiment, where we challenge you selectively, but you also have to hold information in mind. And we could do the reverse of this, where you remember faces, ignore the scenes, hold the faces in mind, and then we probe you on a face. And then we have a third condition that we use as a baseline. In this case, you see these stimuli. You have no goals. You're told you have no goals. You just have to look at them and then press the button of an hour here just to control for the sort of motor response at the end. And what we can do here, and you, and you do these blocks at a time, right, in a whole block. So you do trial, 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 and then you do another block. So you, you get into a set. 
And what we can do is take a look at an area of your brain that we, def we find on another task, like a scene selective area. And if you're not aware of this, you have areas within your visual cortex that are selective for processing different types of information like scenes and faces. So we find that by just showing you a whole bunch of scenes and a whole bunch of faces and then doing a contrast and then say, okay, how does activity in this scene area change based on the goals? So when you have to remember versus passively view versus ignore. Same information, right? So the bottom up is the same. You're exposed to the same. If there's any change in the activity within this brain region, it must be based on goals, and it must be an example of top-down modulation. Well, I'm just going to jump through the story and tell you on younger adults, this is the pattern we see. Very, very reproducible. Almost every person shows the same pattern. They show that there's more activity for remembering the scenes, a middle amount for passive, and we consider this difference to be enhancement of activity. Then there's a, less activity when they're ignoring than they're passively viewing. And we view this as suppression, and we think it's an active process, and we have lots of evidence for that. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. So that's what a 20-year-old looks like when they do that experiment. When we look at 60 to 80-year-olds, this is what we see. They enhance, just like they're 20 years old, with no difference at all. And we've done multiple experiments. This is just one of the, uh, well, two of the studies. And then, this is how they deal with irrelevant information. They do not suppress it below the level of passive view. And if you, this is true whether or not you directly compare to passive view as an internal control or compare across groups looking at ignore scenes. So while they're effectively focusing, they're not ignoring. And this led to a whole series of, of studies in our lab showing that focus and ignoring are not two sides of the same coin like a lot of people have believed. If you focus better, you're not automatically ignoring better. There are dissociable processes, and we have multiple papers showing that they're dissociable at many levels, from the networks that involve them to the way that they impact behavior and in a whole bunch of different ways. So this was one of the first papers that we had showing this selective deficit in suppression. Another interesting uh, finding from this paper is that you know, this individual differences, and some of our older adults did very well in the working memory test. One even got 100%. I don't, actually don't think one of the younger adults got 100%. And some did rather poor, poorly. And if we look at the suppression index compared to younger, it's only the low-performing older adults that are impaired. And we also see that there's a correlation between the working memory performance and the suppression index. So what this means is that your performance or our older adults' performance on this memory test, how well they remember this, was impacted by how well they ignored the irrelevant information. Those that ignored the irrelevant information, neurally, were better at remembering what they were trying to remember. And we have now shown that this is not just true for older adults, but true for younger adults, too. As a matter of fact, we never get a correlation between the focus measure, because it's actually fairly consistent across age groups, across individuals, across trials. The variance that's impacting the behavior is really the ignore side of the coin. Um, so we really see that that's true. I just threw this in because it was a lifespan theme. We have some work on, on children, usually in collaboration. This is with the Bungay Lab. And we see that the same relationship is in 8 to 14-year-olds. The more they suppress, the better they do on the working memory test. You might notice that they actually don't have a suppression deficit. We didn't know that. But you could see they're largely on the right side. They actually have significant suppression, um, which is interesting and the, an another topic. Um, this is another little finding, incidental finding in the study that I think is very telling. What we did is after the experiment, unbeknownst to them, we gave them an entire set of stimuli that we asked them if they remember seeing before. Half they didn't see before and half they actually saw. Some were the relevant stimuli, some were the passive, some were the irrelevant. And here we just asked, here's the remember, fiends ignore, the remember faces ignore scenes. How well did they remember seeing these irrelevant scenes? Well, what we find is that the older adults that were lower performing performed better than the higher working memory performing older adults and they perform better than the younger adults. Right? So they had better memory for information that they should have been ignoring, showing you that it didn't just have impact on their performance in the moment, but actually stuck in their minds for longer periods of time. Um, so this has all sorts of implications um, and shows this interaction between cognitive control, in this case selective attention, working memory, and even long-term memory, showing you how this is really the, I, I always think of the sort of the base of the pyramid, the foundation upon which all other cognitive abilities are really in, in, you know, sort of relying upon. Okay, 
I'm just going to give you a quick run through of some of the other findings on the suppression deficit because it would be an entire talk just to go through these papers. But I think I gave you a good um, overview of what this is, and I'll just tell you some of the other things we found. So we found, so we really teased the suppression deficit apart. We were very interested in it. We found that it's associated with working memory impairment, like I just told you, and this was in two papers. We found that even in younger adults, although they don't have a suppression deficit, if you look at their performance across trials, those working memory trials that they do poorly on, it's because they weren't suppressing. They attend on both the high performance and low performance trials the same, but they don't, when they don't ignore and they process irrelevant information, they drop in working memory performance. So it's not an older adult phenomena. It's worse in older adults, but this ability of, of our, or inability of our, um, to suppress information and its impact on working memory is true of everyone. We show that in older adults, they're actually able to suppress information, but they do it too slowly. So younger adults suppress irrelevant information. When you know that something irrelevant is going to appear, you suppress it within a tenth of a second, which is sort of phenomenal. And this has to do with a lot of expectation processes that are already engaged before that stimulus appears. Older adults do it in around eight tenths of a second. Still within a second, we see evidence that they're suppressing. And the idea is that there's a gate. And if you let that irrelevant information get processed, it creates interference with the information that you're trying to maintain. So it's not just important to suppress. You have to suppress rapidly, very rapidly. Um, it occurs whether or not they're prepared or unprepared for distraction. So in the example that I showed you, they don't really know when the irrelevant information is going to come up unless it's like the last one. We did an experiment where they knew exactly where their irrelevant information was going to be, and we replicated the original finding and showed that they still have a suppression deficit. It occurs whether it's sequential, the way I showed you now, or a paper that we just published showing that it also, it also occurs if the stimuli are overlapped in, in time and space. So even if they're competing for resources at the same time, something where we thought suppression was sort of an automatic process, they still have the exact same suppression deficit in another group of participants. It's not really correlated with other types of suppression abilities, like suppressing motor movements, meaning that there are, although we think, we believe that they're both underlied by networks of the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain, they're likely different areas and they can be dissociable. If you practice on these tasks, you get better. Older adults can suppress more effectively after an hour practice, but they still have a deficit in suppression. And we tried a perceptual training study where we were unable to reverse it. So it's certainly not an easy thing to change. And I'll tell you some in, in, in the last slide, I'll show you how we've had some success more recently. And lastly, it's really associated with changes, and I'm not showing you all this data here, with networks between the prefrontal cortex and sensory cortices. It's this is what we see different between younger and older adults. And again, sort of hearkening back to this, if you look at younger adults, and this is done with uh, TMS, EG, and fMRI in one experiment. This is an fMRI experiment. How we, no matter how we slice it, these networks are different. They're dissociable from each other, the act of attending and ignoring. And they are these long-range networks between the front part of the brain and the visual parts of the brain for a visual experiment or the auditory part. So this is sort of the underpinnings of what suppression, how important this act of ignoring is. All right, let's move on. Interruptions. So interruptions are very different. I'm going to show you they have entirely different mechanisms by which they impair performance of older adults. So for suppression, what we see is that older adults, whether or not they're aware or unaware of a, of a distraction, are over-processing it. And that causes their interference with their working memory. Let's show you an interruption experiment. So this also has a distraction component to it. It's a really even more simple experiment. We show you a face in this sort of baseline. You have to hold it in mind for seven seconds, and then we show you another face. And you have to say, yes, that's the same face, or no, it's not. Something we call a, de a delay recognition task. Very simple. In the distraction condi condition, and again, you do these as, as a block of many trials, we tell you that a face is going to pop up in the middle. And just ignore that face. We're not going to test you on that face. Just ignore it. In the interruption condition, a face pops up in the middle, and you have to make a decision about that face, in addition to remembering this face and then responding if this face matches this one. So you have to say, is this a male over 40 years old? And you just have to make that decision. So this is what we think of as a multitask, or certainly an interruption. And then we have a passive view that we use as a neural baseline. And what we find is that younger adults, if we look across these three conditions, now this is not a very hard task. They're just holding a single face in mind. And this change is very subtle, but it's significant because it's very, very consistent. That performance drops in the setting of distraction, 
and then it drops even more in a setting of an interruption. And if we look at older adults, again, healthy 60 to 80 year olds, this is the pattern we see. So there's an, there does seem to be just a general working memory deficit that we could see and others have seen to some degree at least. But there's this distraction effect that we've already reported many times. I just gave you a full slide on it, and this was since then. Um, and then there's this interruption effect, which is even bigger. This is a second level interaction. Even bigger than the distraction effect is the interruption effect. And so when we interrupt this process, this um, memory process of holding information in mind, older adults, we see even a greater decrement in their performance. So why is that? What is the neural basis of this? Well, we did an EEG experiment. I'm not going to go through all the methodology, but we could time lock events in the brain to these electrical currents and average over many trials when we get these ERPs that have these very characteristic markers. And we've used these markers like this N170 very early, 170 milliseconds in, in multiple studies to show whether someone's paying attention or ignoring a piece of information. And what we find is that in both younger and older adults is a correlation. Those individuals that ignore the irrelevant information, the distractor, better by looking at what's happening in their brain, do better on the working memory task. I already told you that. So this is another replication showing in both populations. Those older and younger individuals that pay less attention to that interrupter, even though they had to make a decision about it, they also do better on the working memory task. So our conclusion was, oh, adults have a distraction problem because they're over-processing irrelevant information, and they must have an interruption problem because they over-process interruptions. And that was not true. So they have a distraction problem, as we said, uh, because there's a difference in how they uh, attend to their relevant information. But when it comes to this interrupter that they had to pay attention to, younger and older adults do it without any statistical difference. We show that with EEG, and we also show that with fMRI, leaving us with no neural explanation of why older adults were more impaired by being interrupted during their working memory task. And so then we did yet another experiment, another fMRI experiment, where we wanted to look at the networks and try to understand what is going on during the entire process, not just when the distraction interruption takes place, but the whole period of working memory maintenance. And so we did something called a functional connectivity analysis to look at connections. It's basically a correlational analysis between activity in one area and activity in another, looking at the variation across trials. And so we can look at an area in the prefrontal cortex and how it's functionally connected with the area where you represent scenes. And we could ask the question, how does functional connectivity change from encoding, when you first see that information, through the delay period right through the interference, so we could look at how it differs between these conditions. And so we identified an area that was most consistently active during encoding, and then just followed it. And this is what we found. These are in young adults. I should have made that clear. So this is the young adult data. I'm going to start with that. This is what we find. Basically, the connectivity that's very high in encoding is essentially preserved. There might be a dip here, but it's not statistically significant. Um, but this could be real and just not reaching that level. But what we find is that those younger adults that dip more here do worse on the task. So what dealing with distraction to us means in this study is that you basically resist distraction. You hold the memory network, which is really represented here, throughout the entire period, even when, oh, sorry, that was the interference. The reason why I, thought I got confused is because it looks exactly the same. So with no interference, it's basically straight. With distraction, it's basically the same. So with distraction, you're resisting interference by essentially doing the same thing that you would do if you had no interference, is you just hold the network throughout the period. For interruption, this is what it looks like. So we get this very significant drop in connectivity. It's actually not even significantly above baseline anymore. So people deal with distractions and interruptions differently. When you're distracted, you can maintain the network. And the degree that you maintain the network in a younger adult predicts how well you do on the memory test. If you're a younger adult and you're interrupted, you always drop the network. Pretty much every single person has this sort of break in the network. And then they reactivate it right before the final uh, probe comes up and they have to make their decision. So we could see that it returns over here. So this is the pattern we see with younger adults. What happens with older adults? Well, I already told you that how they process information just in terms of looking at, at the, not the connectivity, but the univariate data of the interrupter is no different. 
So we're curious, do we see a difference in connectivity? We actually don't. This is what we see. Everything looks the same until you get to that reactivation period. And this is what we're finding. The, the way that older adults deal with interruptions are exactly the same in the moment, unlike distractors. What's different is the switching back to that previous network seems to be inefficient. And those older adults that switch back, because there's variability, switch back more effectively, do better on the memory task. So it's a different type of phenomenon. It's more of this network moving. And we actually have one other piece of information that it's a switching between networks. Because what we can do is look at the other network, the network associated with the faces that interrupt, right? the one that pops up in the middle that you have to make a decision about. And when we look at younger adults, this is the pattern that we see. Just like you would you know, suspect, it's low except in the interruption condition, because that's the only condition that you have to make a decision about the face. Well, what do the older adults look like? So same here, but this is where the difference is. So it's not just that they're not re-engaging the network for the scenes that they should be remembering. They're not disengaging from the face that is essentially no longer relevant because that period has ended. And so we've seen this across other experiments. I'm not going to go through all that data, but whether it's an interruption or a distraction, one of the features that we've now learned is that older adults in a lot of our studies, and a study we just uh, published with Ed Vogel on distraction, is that they seem to be stickier and process this information for longer than younger adults, thus creating more interference. So you could see that it's sort of on both sides, difficulty engaging the suppression mechanisms and then difficulty of letting go of information, whether it was relevant or irrelevant. And so that was the mechanism, and that sort of gives a good example of how you could use these different tools to tease out what is the neural mechanism that accounts for that. You see it's very different than what causes the problems with suppression. Okay, let me tell you uh, about something in a different domain. So that was all in working memory, and we did a ton of work in trying to look at the interruption, the interaction between attention and working memory. But how about long-term memory? How about information that you're holding for more than a couple seconds, for like an hour, let's say? So we did an experiment where we exposed all of our participants to a series of images, 168 images, crowns, so three crowns, four couches for vacuum cleaners. I always think they look like Statue of Liberties, but I think they're vacuum cleaners. And um, they had to answer questions about these, like, can you carry these? Can you put them in a shoebox? But what we didn't ask them was what we wound up asking them when they were inside the MRI scanner an hour later, which is, how many were there? So they, they have the headphones on, they hear crown, and they have to be like, crown. Crown. And the answer is obviously three, but they have to say one, two, three, or four, or new, saying, I didn't see a crown at all. The twist of this experiment is that we have them do this with their eyes closed, their eyes open looking at a gray screen, and their eyes open looking at a busy visual picture, being closer to what you're doing right now, looking at you know, a complex world. And then we asked how their memory changes, both their sort of familiarity, if they remember seeing things or not, and the detailed memory of the actual number of items that they saw. And what we find when we test them uh, behaviorally is that there's a recollection deficit for the details only when the eyes are open in the setting of the visual distractor. Not eyes open looking at a gray screen, not eyes shut. So we see that there's an impact on their ability to recall long-term memories just by having their eyes open. We asked the question, is this somehow related to the fact that their memories are visual? Because everyone says that they do that experiment by using visual imagery. They try to picture it. And then they're confronted with a visual distractor. So maybe there's an interaction like in their visual cortex, right? the sketch pad where they're recreating what they remembered with what they're seeing. So we did the exact same experiment with auditory distraction. So we had people look at a gray screen always, and then they either heard nothing they heard white noise or they heard restaurant chatter. So, right, so we went into a restaurant, taped the normal noise that you would hear at dinner, and basically did the exact same test with visual memories, and we found exactly the same thing with no interaction across these. So we see that it doesn't matter what sensory modality comes in. It's not about necessarily the sensory processing of it. It's really impacting the cognitive control. It's an attentional issue that they're being pulled away by this new information that's being presented, even though they know it's irrelevant. And we did an fMRI experiment of it also, and that basically showed that a network of areas involving, again, the prefrontal cortex, this time visual cortex and also hippocampus, that underlied successful memory in the eyes shut condition 
was basically disrupted by having their eyes open. And a new network involving the prefrontal cortex and a scene area, which was representing what they're seeing, was actually activated in those conditions. So again, showing this switch, this pull of irrelevant information. So this would be an example of distraction. These are all healthy, older, healthy young adults. When we do it on older adults and we do an index, we just do this behaviorally using their overall memory performance as a denominator, we find that they also have a problem in terms of how they deal with this irrelevant visual information in terms of their long-term memory recall, mimicking in many ways what we found with working memory. All right, so these are review articles. I'm not gonna go through all this, but we've done a lot in terms of just the basic, I wanna give all these guys credit, the basic neural mechanisms of the top-down modulation, and then alterations that occur in aging. So we've seen it in multiple domains. There's two review articles here, one that summarizes this, one that summarizes that. I'm basically gonna just summarize it in three statements and without all the details. Is that top-down modulation alterations occur across multiple domains, more than I told you here. We've shown it with discrimination, memory encoding, maintenance, recall, mental imagery, and different types of expectation, both based on time and object. In all cases, this ability to modulate how you process the sensory information based on your goals is deficient as a population. Obviously with individual differences, uh, but as a population, that's what we're seeing. We see that these alterations are associated with really deficits broadly in cognitive control. And we see that across working memory, selective attention, and goal management, the ability to move between tasks, and a lot of that I just showed you. And that all of them seem to be related to changes between the prefrontal cortex and sensory areas of the brain. Those neural networks seem to be involved in both top-down modulation and their disruption is involved in the deficits that we see in these abilities. That's basically the summary slide. Okay, that was the bad news. <laughs> I actually, this is, as I said, the first time that, and some of those slides I have not told in, in many years, but this is the, um, the first time I've actually transitioned between these two and it's sort of a good feeling because the reason why we did this work is that I was getting really fed up with telling that story and leaving it like that. It's one thing, you know, a room of academics, but you tell that story to like, you know, 1,000 older people at an ARP meeting, they're like, that's the end of the movie? Just like that, it's like everyone dies, credit rolls, you know, it's just not really very uplifting. And I was like, I, I went to my lab, I was like, we have to do something about this. There's gotta be a way that we can take advantage of what we've learned over the last decade and all of that uh, information to guide uh, new interventions and see if we can improve cognitive control. So that's actually the story of why we started this work, which was in 2009, we started doing this. And I'm gonna tell you one study. Most frequently, the talks I give really start at this one, and I just put up one slide, that last slide of, of all that information, but I really wanted to give you a better, deeper dive into the alterations that drove this work. So, can we harness plasticity that we know exists throughout our lifespan and develop interactive media, that was really our goal, to improve these abilities and cognitive control that we know are deficient and we have a good idea of why they're deficient, at least in a lot of domains. And so I was inspired in 2009 by this emerging literature showing that video game play, especially immersive interactive video game play, um, was leading to cognitive improvements when you tested in the laboratory and the young, the young people that played them. And so I was like, can we build a game that's built for older adults in our, in our populations that can be played while we record fMRI and EEG that uh, doesn't have violence. We know that this population is not particularly fond of that in, in video games. And just try to create something that's immersive and engaging that could push on these abilities, take advantage that there is plasticity, that the brain does modify itself in response to stimulation, and improve these abilities. And because we've shown, and others have shown, that cognitive control abilities, while they are singular constructs in some ways are interactive in many other ways. And we've shown how they interact. They don't just interact behaviorally and cognitively, but they interact neurally. And we see that there are common systems with the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain. So the hypothesis was that if we could put pressure on one aspect of cognitive control, would it bleed through and show benefits in other aspects? That's what drove us here. And to do that, we built a video game. And this video game was known as NeuroRacer. And, um, we uh, built it with a team of video game professionals from George Lucas's company, LucasArts. They happened to be friends of mine at the time, and they ran the big first-person shooter projects that were being conducted there, 400-person team, 
hundred million dollar projects, massive compared to our world of projects. And they were quite gifted and talented in their world. And so it was really exciting to bring down artists, musicians, um, designers, programmers, introduce them to my students and postdocs and RAs and say, okay, let's build a game. And I had this idea for the game. So the game pretty much turned out based on that idea, but we built a lot into it. So I just want to show it to you real quick. What NeuroRacer is, is a, is a essentially a multitask. You're driving a car on a road using a joystick. You have to go left, right, you have to push up if you're going up a hill to maintain your car on the road. And then you have to respond as rapidly and accurately only to these target signs, the green circles, not to red circles, not to green pentagons, which is actually very hard not to respond to. And so you have these two tasks, both of which are attention demanding. Both tasks have independent adaptive algorithms that use a staircase procedure. So that every moment of gameplay, we're adjusting the information we have about how you're performing, and we're scaling the challenge to that. We also threshold everyone on their single task abilities before they even start playing, so that we could compare easily across age groups. Right? So we get your two single task abilities, and then we put it together and give you that version. What we find is that whether you're aware of it or not, when we were in development, when you play that game, what you do is get good at one thing and abandon the other. It's just a very natural reaction. It's very hard to do both of these things at the same time. So what we've discovered is that we could use rewards and different reward cycles to tether these adaptive loops together. So for example, in when you play NeuroRacer, you never level up in the game unless both of your skills get better than they were previously. And everyone wants to level up, even 80 year olds. It's, it's, it's an irresistible motivation to do better. Um, and so with that, we drive their ability to try to do these two tasks at the same time. And then we do a pre-training assessment. We do training. We had a collaboration with Apple. And we distributed these laptops around the Bay Area, um, which was pretty interesting. And then we look at what happened in their brains and their cognitive performance. So I'm just going to go through some of the data pretty quickly. Um, so what you're looking at here is something that was sort of uh, getting fed up with just looking at 20-year-olds and, and 60, 70-year-olds. We're like, let's try to take a look at the whole decade, the whole lifespan, or at least the adult lifespan. We have some childhood data that I could tell you about in a moment. And see how they multitask on this game. Can it be used, can this game be used as a cognitive diagnostic tool? Can it be used as a neural diagnostic tool? And can it be used as an intervention to improve cognitive abilities? That's what our triple goal was. We wanted to try to accomplish all those. So from a pure cognitive perspective, what 0% means is that you do the sign task equally well when you do it alone as when you're driving at the same time. Um, and every percentage drop is what happens to you when we add on the secondary task. And if you ask a 20-year-old how they will do on this, they will say that they will do perfectly because they believe they are multitasking masters. It's pretty, it's pretty humorous, actually, because they drop a, almost a third in performance when they engage in both of these at the same time. Now, we already know that 70-year-olds were going to be impaired because we showed this in a dozen experiments, right? This, this act of multiple tasks, no matter how, whether they're perceptual, or memory, or attention, usually show a decrement. What happens in the middle, we were not quite sure about, but this is what we found, that it's really very linear. Um, this has been seen with other types of very fluid cognitive abilities like processing speed and working memory, but um, it was really pretty profound. And um, the, actually, the biggest difference between two adjacent decades of life are between 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds, which is fascinating. We're actually exploring that in probably the only fMRI study to focus on a difference between those two age groups. Because this is not a subtle difference. Um, and they're pretty close in age, so it's pretty, it's interesting to see. Just to let you know, we've recently done eight, to, we've had eight to 12 year olds perform this, and they are around the level of like 35 year olds. They're, they're around over here. So this is something that climbs and then declines. Okay. So let, what happens in the brain during this? You're already like, this is more bad news. You, you, you promised me something more. Um, but this is a sort of at least we're all in this together type of bad news, right? So it's not just like this is preserved and then just plummets. It's like a lifetime thing. Um, we could record brain activity. Oh, do I not have this here? OK, maybe I show this at the end. This is, again, older slides I'm pulling from. So we bring another group back, and we have them train. And um, A, we showed that in this training group, so on a pre-training, we basically replicate this finding. And we have three groups in this experiment. One group comes back a month later after having done nothing. And that's just to see what it, are the practice effects of the outcome measures. And we see there's a non-significant change. Then we have the other groups play at home for 12 hours. One hour a day, 
three days a week for four weeks, 12 hours of gameplay. And then we have a, what I think is a really good con control group. It's probably as, as good as I've seen. And that's a group that plays exactly the same game. They play NeuroRacer, but they play it in single task mode. They do the sign task, they do the driving test, but they never do them at the same time. So they're adaptive, they have the same reward cycles, everything's the same except that competition of the two tasks for your attention at the same moment. And what we see is a trend towards an improvement in their ability to multitask on the game, but it's not significant. If that was our training group, uh, that would have probably not been a publication. And so this, is no, this change is no different than this change in this group here. But when we look at our multitasking training group, we see a pretty robust increase that actually exceeds these two groups and even exceeds our 20-year-olds on that single visit. And I have to tell you, I think this looks pretty impressive on a graph, but the reality is if you watch these older adults a month later come back into the lab, they are just amazing at this. And this is actually pretty impressive because they're managing these two tests simultaneously. There's lots of like little hidden cool details in here that I don't even have in these slides. But for example, if you take this group and this group and just look at their single task performance after training, there's no difference between them. It's the difference to multitask on the game that's different. So it's not the sum of those skills getting better. It's like another act is the act of doing them at the same time. Um, let's see what else I have here. Okay, we brought them back six months later and looked at their performance in this game. What we found is that their ability to multitask on the game itself was not declined six months later without even having a booster. And this group, if they even lifted above baseline, were firmly there. If we knew that that was going to happen, we would have done all the other things I'm going to show you now at six months, but we thought that they would be absolutely at baseline. We weren't funded to do it. We were just curious. Let's just bring them in and at least have them play the game. But now all of our experiments are very focused on understanding this um, sort of sustainability that was unexpected to us. Let's tell you about uh, what happens in the neural data. So, Pre and post, they, do, they play this game, but we record EEG activity. We have, another F, we have an fMRI version now, but I'm just going to tell you about the EEG data, which was part of this paper. And what we did was we looked at what happens in the brain at the most intense part of gameplay, which is when a sign comes up and you're also driving. And we time lock that event and looked at a burst of low frequency activity called theta that emerges from the prefrontal cortex. This signature was interesting to us because it has been shown to be associated with every type of cognitive control. You see that it's, it's responsive to working memory load, that it's there when you have selective attention and you have distraction interference, it's there during sustained attention. It just seems to be capturing, pretty in a, in a low spatial resolution, the engagement of the prefrontal cortex during cognitive control. And when we look at 20-year-olds, so this is uh, the nose up top, the ears on the side. We're looking at an average, looking down, called the topography of EEG data. And this is the power spectrum. So you could see there's this burst that occurs one third of a second after a sign comes up. It's stronger if you're driving at the same time than if you're not. And um, it just, you could see, it goes from the cooler colors up to the warmer color, up to yellow. Um, so it's right on the front part of the brain. It bursts up. It's pretty much gone at the end of the second, even before the second's gone, it's, it, it's already diminished. If we look at our older group before training, this is what we see. So it's sort of a peak, right? I mean, it's definitely something there that emerges. This is in the same time frame. You could see it's only around you know, halfway up, not really reaching the yellow level on this power spectrum. We don't see significant changes, although you could see that it looks like a trend to one, especially over here. But again, there's tons of variability, and we don't really see a true statistical difference between these two groups and how they changed. But this group showed a really remarkable increase in this measure of midline frontal theta. You could see in many ways, and for many people, though not significantly, it exceeds that of 20-year-olds. Um, so that was pretty cool, right? So this is a third of a second, really rapid engagement of the prefrontal cortex after a sign comes up. I want to show you one piece of data that I don't think we posted on, online, um, but to me it tells that there's much more than that finding here that we're now trying to dissect using combined EEG fMRI. What I'm going to show you is a movie of those older adults before and at the training, same people, just looking at 600 milliseconds, so just a little over half a second. And you're going to see the evolution of theta activity in their brains over this very short time, locked. So zero is right when the sign comes up. And you could see how the change is not just in the peak level, but in pretty much every metric that you can imagine it. 
So it has a different distribution, it starts earlier, it lasts longer, it reaches a higher level. And, and now I think with the addition of fMRI, we'll understand a little bit what this means from a neural point of view. But it's a pretty big change. Um, this is the, what the neural data looks like in the paper that there's, you know, one, one thing that we we're interested in, it didn't have to be a change in the same metric that was deficient that led to the improvement, right? It could have been another neural mechanism that helped them get better after training that never was related to what was deficient in the first place, maybe something that they compensated. So that's what this added, that what was deficient is what changed after training. And we don't just see it in terms of the frontal theta burst, we also see it in terms of a functional connectivity, a network view of the brain, which is one of our main interests, looking at theta coherence across the brain is deficient in, in younger adults, older adults compared to younger adults before training, and then only in the multitasking training group do we see that that's equilibrated and is no longer deficient. So what about other skills, right? This was the primary goal of this experiment, was to see what other cognitive control skills that we think are part of the same domain also improved. And we were really delighted because it was really not incredibly powered to see subtle changes like this, that both working memory improved, so only significantly improved in the multitasking training group, not in the single task or training group at all. The no contact control is not significantly diminished, it's very frequently that no contact controls show this pattern. It's really interesting about what that means. But in either case, we see that it improves here. And on a sustained attention task, we see improvement. By the way, this working memory task, I don't normally tell the whole story, so I don't, was the same task that I showed you with face and then the interruption face and then the face at the end. And not only did they improve in the no interference condition, which is the data here, but they also improved during an interruption. And that's something that we can never, ever fix. We've, we've done multiple training studies and have never been able to reverse that except in this. So you almost have to expose people to interference to get them to manage interference. We haven't found another way of doing it. This, this task is called the TOVA task. It's frequently used in the ADHD literature. And what it is, it's basically a sustained attention task, like a very impoverished environment, finding a rare target. Um, there's no change in their accuracy. It's not like they're more impulsive. They're just quick on responding and also withholding to non-targets. So that was really uh, encouraging that we start seeing those abilities. And maybe what's even more exciting, at least to us, is that if you look at the individual differences and the change in theta, and you could see many people didn't change, but that there is you know, sort of a low level correlation, but a significant one showing that the change in theta from before to after correlates with how well they perform on this other task. And it also correlates with how well they sustain the multitasking ability in the game itself six months later. So that's basically a, a quick run through of that paper. Um, we think it's really exciting. I usually try to frame this from the perspective that we think that this tells us that there's a signal here, that there's something, this consistency across many elements of the data that we're able to push on a process through adaptivity and feedback, lead to some changes in other abilities, and also see a bit of the mechanism of what underlies that. But I wouldn't say that this paper is at like the sort of prescriptive level. I don't certainly tell people to play this game because of this data. But I do think it sets up the type of studies which we've done on much larger numbers of people without neuro recordings. Um, and also comparing to other things like exercise and other types of, of um, interventions that should improve cognitive control to see can it reach that level. So that's really where we're at here. I just want to give you a quick look. Oh, I have some conclusions. So adaptive training of this basic information processing is driving enhancement of these abilities in older adults, and that they're associated with both early sensory processing changes and engagement of prefrontal cortex, which is sort of the flip side of what I told you were the deficits. So I think it's encouraging to us in the lab that we're able to take neural markers that we already characterized and deficits that we understood and build something that was customized and targeted, then put it in a controlled study with neural markers of outcome measures and start understanding how we could change the system. So that's what I hope that others will take away. And it's a hard process. So that process took five years. So we started that in 2009. So it was a year of game development and then three years of recording across those three experiments. So, and then a year of analysis. So uh, it's, a, it's a hard process and it really, really in my experience, demands working with professionals in game design because building something that is really strong enough to push on, on plasticity and harness it and to change the brain is not easy. And we have plenty of examples where, where that doesn't happen. Okay, so in my closing, um, I'd like to just dive into no more data. I, I have no more data to share with you, so this is gonna be really light because all of this is where we're going. So first, 
a lot of people want to know what happened to NeuroRacer. So essentially, NeuroRacer has left the lab. I've let go of it. It is up to everyone else to figure out how good it is in, in many different um, uh, form, formulas. And so um, I helped, so that pattern of independent adaptive algorithms that are tethered by reward cycles. I patented, UCSF owns that intellectual property, or at least in, it's in process. And then I helped co-found a company called the Killy Interactive Labs that is now trying to build a real game, not the game that we built, which is better probably than as in most cognitive neuroscience experiments, but it's not the type of game that anyone would pay if they weren't an experiment. Um, so it demands like a full game team to do this. And now they're built this game. So I just want to show you a quick look at what can happen when a game leaves your laboratory and goes into like a professional studio. All those folks from LucasArts that I work with now work full time for this company, so that's sort of cool. It's also interesting that LucasArts was actually bought by Disney and dissolved like a year later, so they got lucky by leaving the uh, entertainment video game world when they did. All right, so this is what uh, Evo looks like. So when you build a game and you want people to play it of different age groups and different gaming experience, you need to bring on high levels of art, music, and story. And that's what's so challenging. And then the trick is to take those things to increase the reward cycles in the appropriate way. You can see it uses an accelerometer, it's on an iPad now, but also to keep the same basic mechanics that underline the original uh, sort of device, right? So you could see both skills have to go up in order to get the rewards. See, big rewards. And then you can do things that we never did, like make different immersive environments. Um, also, the tasks change here, unlike NeuroRacer. So the path is harder to navigate. There's more difficult perceptual tasks that you have to do. When we test this in children, all they want to do is customize their avatar. That's the only thing that, that they care about <laughs> at all. Only feedback. And so, so you could do that, which apparently is important to get them immersed in the game as a character. Um, and so that's probably not the latest, but what it looks like, which is, yes, it's already a year old, which is pretty cool. So what happens to that game now? So that game has a very different course than most of these type of games. You cannot find it on the App Store. You can't get it anywhere. The company has made a decision. I'm just an advisor to the company now, so they make decisions that I don't necessarily agree with, but I do think that this is an interesting one, to take the game through clinical testing in a wide range of disorders and try to get FDA approval and show that it could reach the same endpoints with a better side effect profile than all the drugs that are currently used to treat these conditions. So that's what's going on now. Um, there's no data, but there's, well, I'm actually gonna see data next month as the advisor on this study that is being run by other folks. Um, so that's the plan. Right now, the game has to be customized to different populations. Feasibility testing has to be done, uh, but probably starting early next year, it'll start going through the pivotal studies just like it was uh, a device for FDA approval, and then maybe wind up being prescribed by physicians. So we'll see, but it's pretty exciting to think that anything could compete with the pharmaceutical industry in this domain. Um, <laughs> fascinating, unexpected, the two biggest funders of the early research were actually pharmaceutical companies. Shire Pharmaceutical makes Adderall for ADHD, and Pfizer makes Aricept. Um, and they, these are million dollar investments, uh, multi-million dollar investments. So it's pretty interesting to see drug companies, which I think are also frustrated that the drugs don't work perfectly and there's lots of side effects. Not to understate it too much, but, um, and so to think that there's another type of intervention that maybe could be used as an adjunct treatment or maybe even replace it or lower doses is really interesting to them. All right, so I just want to conclude with what we're doing in our lab now. So that's sort of what happens is that at some point it's better for that pathway if it just leaves our domain of the lab, which left us, left us sort of with like an you know, empty nest syndrome. We're like, oh, there goes the baby that we worked on for five years and grew up, and we know it has to go to college without us hanging out with it all the time. It's, per, it's better for its development if that happens. So what do we do? We're like, we can make, we can make new babies. So that's what we do. We built this new lab called the Neuroscape Lab, which is really meant to bridge technology and neuroscience. And given the success of that last project, which was certainly high risk, but high reward in the end, we're like, we should just go for it and, and just not be burdened by any you know, preconceived views of what will work and what will not work. We should take advantage of the fact that we live in the Bay Area and are surrounded by most of these tech companies. And let's just go there and get some 
some people to donate money to us so that we can do these things that we want to do. So I'm just going to show you some pictures of this. I'm not going to go into it. I could show you more afterwards. But we built this lab. This is our new neuroscience building. It's only a year and a half old at UCSF. And this is what our new lab looks like. So it looks like a high level interactive media lab, but it's sitting right inside a neurology, neuroscience, psychiatry clinic. And right next to the scanner, so I run the two scanners right over here. So we have this amazing control room with the ability to manipulate and pretty much record everything during gameplay. And we have a mobile station and uh, also a seated station. I'll just show you some of the new technology that we're very excited about. We do a lot of stuff on mobile. We want to move things as rapidly as possible outside of our lab into people's homes. We think that this is going to let us do it a lot better. A lot of our new studies, we have both the deep dive in lab study with neural recordings, and then we have we never even met you study where you just could, we could send you links to this where we could look for like real world transfer, things that we just can't get on our, any study that we've done in the lab. Like how does this actually impact people's lives and you need a lot larger number. So we're very excited about mobile. We're also excited about mobile sensors for gamma experience, skin response, heart rate variability. We're pretty close to having a mobile EEG that we're satisfied with that we're going to send to people's homes and record brain activity during gameplay while at home. We hope to do this next month so we could see plasticity curves, not just of behavior, but of neural measures. So that's something we're excited about. We're very excited about two new forms of technology that we use a lot. This is known as the Oculus Rift. There's several companies that are making it. It's virtual reality goggles. They're Has anyone been in one of these? They're amazing, amazing immersive technology that the world has not seen yet, but you will, um, maybe next year. But th this is certainly the future. We know that because we have three giants. And Oculus wasn't a giant until Facebook bought them for $2 billion earlier this year. So there's a lot invested in this technology. And I could tell you it's pretty impressive. And so we could create even more immersive environments with larger fields of view and all sorts of things. This is actually Mickey Hart, who's the drummer from The Grateful Dead, who's a big collaborator of our labs working on a, a game that we're developing. And he's in an Oculus Rift, and this is a 64-channel wireless EEG cap that is now validated in our lab to be pretty much as good as our wired system. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. We do a lot with motion capture. This uses the Connect 2, which is part of the Xbox One. Uh, uh, recently came out and has the PlayStation Network and something that we're working on. Uh, excuse me, on, on the Connect network. And um, what we have here is the ability to have people play games not just with their fingers, but with their whole body. And I'll tell you what we're doing with that. OK, so I'm just going to conclude. Um, I'm not going to tell you these games, but if you want to see them, I could always bring them up after if anyone's interested. But we have four new games that we're designing. We've been working on these for over a year now. We're basically like an R&D lab now. It's weird. We like. We have like identity complex. We really don't do any research right now. Um, but we're building these games. This is a meditation inspired game that was NIH funded pilot study. This is a rhythm game that's meant to improve the rhythms of your brain by teaching you how to entrain with external rhythms better. And obviously, we don't know if any of this will work, but it's going to go through all the same sort of pipeline that you saw on, on the Nature paper. And hopefully, you know. In several years from now, you might see data from these. This is an attention game that's meant to be played inside virtual reality. And then we have a game that integrates physical and cognitive fitness at the same time called Body Brain Trainer that uses motion capture. And so we hope that we'll understand a lot about plasticity through all these approaches. We record a lot more than neural data now, but neural data is certainly like a key thing for us. And what I'm most excited about, and this is not next year and probably longer than that until we prove it with research, is really how these all interact with each other, right? Because that is what I think eventually, when we look back in a decade from now, the way that we really change our brains are through a very multimodal approach that's very personalized. And so while we wait until we do the study on all these, first we have to do them alone with the appropriate controls, then we start putting them together. I am playing all of these games. So I've actually already started the meditation game and the physical fitness game because I'm like, why would I wait? I'm 46 years old. So I'm playing these games. I played this every morning last week, and it is fully cognitively and physically exhausted. And so the idea is by the end of this year, we'll have these all together. And I already challenged my lab. And so what happens when you take all this? We could get like a neuro iron man. That's the, <laughs> that's the goal. We'll say. Anyway, thank you for your attention. Probably not. You'd probably get killed doing that. <laughs> um, no, so 
I'll, I'll answer that question. It's, it's, it, there's a lot of layers on that. So, you know, the, the general question, obviously answering your email when you're driving is certainly not a good idea, but is engaging in multitasking activity in daily life when, when you know, you don't have the risk of dying, is that, is that reasonable? Would that do this? Or some people say, if anyone's interested in this, I'll tell you about that after. It's probably distracting them. Um, some people say, well, I already drive to work, right? So why do I need to play NeuroRacer? So the real reason why we build these games and why we think that they are impactful and that hopefully we'll show that they're even much more impactful than we've already shown as we get better at designing and building them and better at understanding the design of testing them is that they challenge you appropriately to your ability and constantly push on that. When you engage in the real world, we tend to not do that. We tend to take the easier way, the more comfortable way. If you can do that in the real world at the appropriate level, sure, it's just not how we normally engage. Like I drive on a very challenging route to work through San Francisco, and if I ever felt like I mastered that route, I would not look for a more challenging one. <laughs> And, and that's just the way it is. We, we do tend to find sort of the low energy peaks and the comfort and get good at things. But these games never let you get really good at them. They're always stepping it up. And the way that we're able to do that and not frustrate you is through rewards. So your reward is the game getting harder. And we just say, hey, you leveled up. And that means that you're playing a harder game. And so that's why it's different. So it, it's more of a selective pressure on the system and then using reward cycles to reinforce that. And it's hard to do that in the real world. But that being said, I don't think that we're there yet. And I think that tons of real, as a matter of fact, that's my only advice to older adults that are saying, well, what do I do now? Is that the things that you do that are good for your body, all the lifestyle recommendations that cardiologists seem to be more readily to give advice than neurologists and psychiatrists, but things like nutrition and physical fitness and stress management um, are the, probably the best things that we have right now. Um, as a matter of fact, these games are not so different than those. They just put them in a different package to make them more deliverable. Not really. Well, I mean, if you look at the, well, it's not the time, but if you look at the sustained attention literature, what you will find almost completely are the most boring things you could ever imagine. As a matter of fact, most people consider sustained attention to be a type of vigilance where you purposefully create a very impoverished environment to see how long people could hold their attention even though there is nothing to drive it. Neuroracer is sort of the opposite of that. It got, it's got ongoing reward, it's rich and colorful, you're going through a 3D environment. So that's what was an interesting transfer is that the sustained attention game is called the Tove. It's just like this little shape comes up and then there's nothing and then another shape comes up and then nothing and then finally after like 20 seconds a different one comes up. So that's why, that's why it's a different task. Well, I mean, that's what the studies are exactly trying to do. So that sustained attention outcome in kids with ADHD is one of the main outcomes because they're one of the main outcomes for Adderall studies. So we'll see if it has an impact on that. If it does, it's because it's all really about control, basically. So if you could control, if, if it does. So if you could control yourself in this environment, which really is hard to do, and it took you a long time to figure out how to do it, then when you're in a very different environment, like this impoverished environment, where you have to respond to these rare things, you can apply your control, even though it's different. Does that make sense? And same thing in the working memory task. A face comes up, it's like focus, and they could do it. So you know, obviously this has to be you know, reproduced and extended and understood more. But the basic idea is that it's about having a better cognitive control system. And because there's an underlying common mechanism between them, 
which we see some evidence of that neurally, that you engage it in the way you want when you need it, even if it's a different type of control. Does that make sense? That would, be, that would be the goal. Now, it's very possible that we won't see that, that we need a different type of game that pushes on a different way in the system if that doesn't work, and that's okay. You know, I mean, lots of drugs fail, and you build new ones, and so it's a similar idea. Um, we don't know. We're just at the very beginning. But just jumping off of that, because I think it's relevant, I have a colleague, Pat Arian, who's done depression research for a long time. She's now doing a study with Evo for depression. And people are like, why? There's nothing emotional about that game. And I guess an emerging view in the psychiatry and psychology field is that depression is not really fully about emotion. It's about control. And that by learning how to have better control of how you process information, you might have less depressive symptoms, even though the game doesn't have any emotional valence in itself. And some of the preliminary results are pretty amazing in that regard. So there's another example, you're like, how does that happen? And I would say it happens because you have better control. But that's, that's the question. Yeah, well, so let's start with the, the form. So the, without like talking about companies in particular, because that always makes me feel uncomfortable. I never get through a question and answer period without being asked that, by the way, so I'm pretty used to it. But the, I, so our basic design principles are different than a lot of others. Um, so we think and believe, although it's pretty hard to show this, and we haven't tried, but we want to eventually, since we're very motivated by it, that. The way you lead to change is through deeply immersive, engaging pressure on the system. And that this is the same concept of physical fitness training as well. That if you just flirt lightly with it, the system doesn't really change. It's plastic, but it's not jello, right? It just doesn't move, which would be quite dangerous. It needs, it needs pressure. And I think if you take a cognitive paradigm and sprinkle some game dust on it and make it colorful and some rewards, it's not engaging to a lot of people, and they don't push on the system hard enough. They might not play it long enough. They might not play it deeply enough. So that's like a general view um, of why we spend well over a year on each single game, is to order to get that. Um, now, I don't know. I mean, I, my read of the action uh, game literature, you know, besides Sean uh, Green's and Daphne Bivolet's, is it's been reproduced in many different domains. And I know it's not perfect, but you know, these type of studies are really challenging for lots of reasons. One of them is the outcome measures, picking the right outcome. There's lots of reasons why things don't work. In general, I think the literature is sort of convincing. Um, if, it, if, if it's not, then I would say that those games, um, although they have a lot of the mechanics of, this, of these games, have nowhere near the level of adaptivity that we see. So do you play first person shooters? Uh, I prefer Tetris, which is extremely OK. <laughs> and Tetris is adaptable, and Tetris probably has, has benefits, but not necessarily in the cognitive control domain. And so that's the whole thing. So saying like games help you or games don't help you, or they're good or bad, is saying like food or drugs are good or bad. I mean, it's like a giant genre of, of different uh, tools that have, all have different mechanisms. So, you know, the reason that we've never just taken commercial games and used them is A, we can't study them neurally because we don't have markers, but they also don't have the same adaptivity that we reach here. So I don't know, I can't prove that, and I haven't tried to yet, but that's why we spend so much time doing this. And now we're going to hopefully show that they have an impact, and then hopefully others will show that when you compare them to different types of control groups or stand, you know, other standard of care that you'll see that they're just as good. But we're still at the infancy in this. Completed you? Yep. Uh, yeah, it's very fascinating. I'm wondering about the cognitive uh, mechanism that could allow multitasking. So suppose you have, you're doing one task, and the second task interrupts you. Um, you have several choices. You could hold <coughs> the first task somewhere in the background, or you could have a timing signal that tells you to check for a second task, or you could somehow mentally combine the two tasks and make it into a new chunk that then you couldn't possibly forget the, sec the original task. Yeah. Do you, is there any evidence that you can think of on 
doing? Yeah, this, this work by Maroy, are you familiar with his, some of his work? He showed um, in some degree of, uh, uh, in some training studies of multitasking that um, the prefrontal cortex was sort of switching more rapidly. So it wasn't really necessarily chunking them, but just, you know, there's like this switch cost, but that was diminished more neurally as evidence of more rapid switching. I don't have any evidence of why that happens in our research, but um, all of those are possibilities. That paper sort of, I guess it was a neuron paper, sort of eliminated the others and thought that it was just more efficient moving of those circuits, but not like combining them. Sometimes what happens is that one task becomes automatic. Um, that seems to be true in the literature, or maybe even both, but like, you know, Maybe at one time you had to pay attention when you chewed gum, but you probably don't now, and it probably wouldn't even be or shouldn't be considered to be multitasking if you're chewing gum and doing something else, because it's fully offloaded from the cognitive control system. And so if you can unload a task off of your prefrontal cognitive control system, then you will get better in it. We try to avoid that by constantly upping the difficulty. <laughs> So that's how we avoid that. As a matter of fact, I don't think we've done it perfectly. In, in the new game, Evo, as you play that perceptual task, um, then it gets much more complicated. Then it's like three features that you have to match. So we constantly are trying to fight against automaticity in that game. So that's some of the reasons why uh, people get better. There's one, one other thing I think that maybe you'll find interesting. Um, from our, our game uh, point of view is that what you do on the break periods we now think is very important. Like you can't play those games for very long. You need to take a break. And so we're sort of inspired by a, a literature showing that nature exposure can improve uh, restoration of cognitive fatigue. So we're now doing an experiment where we have all different break periods like check your email, which is what you would normally do in your break. Or, oh, and then we created this beautiful virtual nature experience that you do in the breaks. And we think that we could show that the learning curve is also impacted by how you restore along the way. One last thing I'll tell you. So this over here is called the Glass Brand. It's a technology that we've been working on for over a year with collaborators at UCSD and Scott Makig's lab in the Swartz Center and a, and a company called um, NVIDIA, which builds GPU units. And what it is, it's actually the brain of someone in our lab. It's a combination of MRI and EEG. And we're very motivated to try to get real-time EEG processing with as much spatial localization information as possible in as short a time as possible. So what we, what we have here is an MRI. So we have the structure of the brain and an MP rage. We have a DTI image, which are the fibers. We bring all this data inside Unity Game Engine, which makes it totally manipulatable. And then this is the 64 channel wireless EEG cap. We've been able to get within 100 milliseconds artifact correction, source localization using that person's MRI data and also multivariate Granger causality, which gives us directionality of flow, at least as a, as a sort of computational model. And then we just visualize that on the scaffolding of the, of the white matter that we have from the MRI. And so, and then we work with lots of artists and try to present it in, as an authentic, but as beautiful a way as possible. And it's pretty, pretty cool. You can actually fly through this in virtual reality in our Oculus headset as well, which is very surreal, especially if it's your brain and you're in the EG cap. <laughs> And where we're going with this now is, A, we're interested is can you use real-time EEG data as, uh, as, a, as a new type of diagnostic, potentially watching someone play a game and look what happens in the brain in real time. But what we're most excited about is that all our games right now work on adaptive algorithms, as I've described many times. Your performance guides the gameplay difficulty in real time. Every second of gameplay is changing the engine of the game and, and upping it. What we want to do is have you play a game with a glass brain and use the neural data in a closed loop fashion to drive the gameplay. So that even if some aspect of how your brain is processing information, like some visual signal, is not being outputted in your final behavior because it's something else is compensating for it, but, but it's still a limitation, it's a weakness in the system, we could feed that data in and guide the feedback and the adaptivity built off that signal, and so we could fine tune processing, at least this is our goal, sort of like a gamma knife, like directed selectively for deficient processings in real time. So that's where we're going with this. We have a whole team working on that. And lastly, we're using this EEG data not just to guide the game algorithm in this sort of neurofeedback approach, but we're also using it to guide different types of stimulation parameters of electrical stimulation. We've already shown that we can start changing the learning curve that way. So maybe it's not for everyone, but if you have a stroke or a lesion 
and need extra plasticity, we could use the neural data in real time in a closed loop to guide the stimulation, all of it during gameplay and all of it tied to stimuli in the game. So that's where we're really heading. But that'll be a long time. Okay, thank you everyone.